Welcome to another Backyard Professor video. I'm going to uh, do a video on a, a new light on the horizon. One of the most fantastic, interesting, scholarly approaches to the Pearl of Great Price that I think I have ever seen. It is very, very impressive. And I get the good pleasure of introducing you to the new book by Jeffrey M. Bradshaw. I received my copy here. In his own image and likeness. Ancient and modern perspectives on the Book of Moses. This, uh, this particular text is kind of a miniature text. You can see by the size of it. It's only a mere 1,100 pages. I'm a little bit disappointed Jeff couldn't give us something really serious like a four or 5,000 page book. You know, 1,100 pages in three years isn't all that impressive. It's only eight and a half pounds. <laughs> I mean, Jeff has absolutely knocked the roof off the house with this mammoth tome. I am deeply impressed. I interviewed Jeff uh, last year at the fair conference. I'm going to take the, the book cover off. It's just going to get in the way. 1,100 pages, and the nice thing is that he exclusively focused on one part of the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Moses. And he was telling me a couple years back in an email, he said, uh, I'm writing this book, you know, and I want to reference some of your materials, and he did, which really surprised me. <laughs> kind of interesting there, but he mentioned that uh, no one has ever really uh, put together the astonishing information on our book of Moses in the Progate Price. You know, Hugh Nibley focuses on the book of Abraham because of the wonderful facsimiles, as does John Gee and Michael Dennis Rhodes and those, and, and uh, several LDS Egyptologists. And uh, Nibley had touched here and there on the book of Moses, and then some of the other Progate Price commentaries, they kind of did a Oh, a, a superficial analysis of the book of Moses. Jeffrey, for three years, researched this magnificent tome. 1,100 pages in three years. Now, I don't intimidate very easy. I really don't. I've been reading all of my life. And I've been reading the scholarly literatures of the scriptures. Uh, that, for whatever reason in my heart, I have had a burning desire to learn. And or, uh, this book just intimidates me. <laughs> wow. One man in three years can put together something like this. And the amazing thing is, this is not fluff and pablum. This is not your typical Sunday school manual or priesthood meeting manual. This is an in-depth, serious, scholarly, artistic, literary, poetic analysis where he brings in sources from absolutely all over. This is the finest commentary on the planet on our book of Moses. Now, I've said it before, and I will say it again. If you, my viewers, do not purchase this text, you really are cheating yourselves. The astonishing thing is, among other astonishing things, it's only $50. He could have easily charged $150 and, and sold it like crazy, too. $50. The artwork in it's magnificent. It's such a beautiful book. This is one of the only books where I haven't just immediately started writing and cross-referencing because every page is absolutely beautiful, and it's huge. It's huge. There is so much information in this thing, it's absolutely breathtaking. He takes it from the Jewish commentators, the Islamic commentators, the LDS commentators, the ancient literatures. Absolutely beautiful text. And I want to give you a couple of highlights out of his book to introduce you to the finest text on the book of Moses in existence right now. And it's available for we LDS. It's available for everybody. There's a revolution going on. I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not. 
and, and I'm going to introduce this to the kids next week in Utah when I go down to give the uh, uh, family home evening lecture to the uh, college kids. There is a revolution going on in Pearl of Great Price studies in just the last 10 years. I just put together this morning in a stack of the information available to us. Over the last 10 years, it's over 5,100 pages of stellar scholarly research and analysis and spiritual understandings and absolutely incredibly overwhelming confirmation of the pearl of great price. This is like nothing else I've ever seen. Then I thought another place where Jeff really does an interesting analysis is on Adam, which means many. He says, uh, Several LDS scholars conclude that the phrase, which is many, could mean one of three things. That Adam is the name of the first man of all men among all the worlds that God has created. The second idea is that Adam is the name given to the first man on each of the many worlds God has created. Or that there are many descendants of Adam on this earth. It's Kind of interesting, isn't it? The name Adam occurs in several Semitic dialects and languages. Westerman accepts a derivation from the Arab term adim, meaning skin or surface, thus simultaneously conveying the idea of the skin of a human being, Adam, and the surface of the earth, the Adama. That's how it plays out in Hebrew. I've written on this, the play of words on Adam. The motive associating Adam with the earth is found in several places in our book of Moses. For example, Adam is made from the dust of the ground, and it's later cursed because of him, and he will return to it when he dies. Whitlock also points out the association between the red earth and the red blood, the Hebrew word dom, blood being a condition of mortality. He observes that there may be something symbolic in the joining of the mortal or the blood, Adam, with the living Eve, the Hebrew is Hava, which means life. That's kind of beautiful, isn't it? To produce living offspring that transcends earthly life. And it's exo it echoes the reverse in reverse in the nativity. Taking a cue from Moses 134, Nibley says, Many as one connotation of the Egyptian name Atum, A-T-U-M, which also means many, very interesting there. He cites studies that define it to mean both the creator, the ancient one, and the collective sum of all future beings. Atom in the Egyptian means all embracing, the sum of everything, or the uniting of many into one combining all pre-existent beings in a single archetype who thereby represents all beings thereafter. It's a beautiful summary of Adam, isn't it? In Abraham 1.3, the word Adam is associated with the idea of his being a first father. The 1981 edition of the Pearl of Great Price corrected a portion of the text in this verse. It was given previously as the first man who is Adam, our first father but in 1981 was amended to read the first man who is Adam or first father. Note that Eve is similarly referred to in Moses 4.26 as the first of all women, and that Nephi refers to Adam and Eve as our first parents. Now Brigham Young taught that Adam signifies first man and Eve signifies first woman. Every world has an Adam and an Eve. Named so simply because the first man is always called Adam and the first woman is always called Eve. Blood and life. Isn't that fascinating? By implication, Munoah connects the motive of being the first with that of being the oldest, hence the title of the Ancient of Days that Adam bore. In the book of Daniel, Joseph Smith identified the Ancient of Days as Adam. It's, it's a very interesting idea. That's on page 66 and 67 in Bradshaw's book. And there's thousands of interesting ideas like that in this book that I will explore with you.